Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of this is Revolution Podcast. If you're new to the channel, please hit like, please hit subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell. If you're on Twitch, let your people know what you want from this show. Pass it around. But we want to make sure you guys are always alerted whenever we go live because we're constantly doing cross streams with other channels, adding new shows. I'm constantly gentrifying White Guy Wednesday. I will be once again gentrifying White Guy Wednesday tomorrow night with my very good friend, my play brother, Burt Cooper. It will literally be like you were watching Huey and Riley in real life. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite shows. I literally named one of my children, well, not by myself, his mom had something to do with it. Um, after one of the characters in Boondocks, you'll have to guess which one. I think you'll be surprised which one it is. It's not Huey or Ruckus. No. <laughs> People don't want to be funny. Haha, <laughs> beat you to the punch. So we'll be doing that tomorrow, talking about the boondocks. Also, before we start, there is some big news in the TIR camp. I'm finally going to have my work published. All these years of playing these shows and recording and hanging out with all these bands and interviewing people. I wrote a really long essay about it a while back. That essay is finally going to be in print. Thank you very much, Glacier Media and Everyday Analysis. Thank you so much, Alfie, for hitting me up and, and making sure that can happen. I'm pretty excited. This is one of the my favorite things I ever wrote because I did do a lot of like interviews about this topic. So I hope you guys get it. There's some moderators here that should be putting a link up to that if not i'm sure we'll put it in the comments also we will be doing the champagne room if you are a patron that link is up I'm not lagging like i usually do and mt will be joining me and we'll probably be continuing this conversation i'm sure you guys have a lot or will have a lot to say about what we're talking about as it is a pretty hot button issue and much like the show we did a few weeks ago on uh suicide i think this is people have a lot of personal experiences with addiction be it their own family members i know it definitely touches me in a personal place I have my feelings about it also i'll be in america next week doing i'll be speaking with katherine lou at pomona college as part of the Theory Underground Tour, we'll be talking about definitely the, the book that's coming out that I wrote. And also we'll be talking about all things PMC. As well. I'll be there with the Catherine Liu. I don't know who else is going to be there speaking on the panel other than the Theory Underground guys. It should be a lot of fun. We've been talking about this for a while. Those guys are going on tour right now. They're in the East Coast. I think they're speaking with Daniel Tut this evening in D.C. in just in a matter of a week or so, they're going to be all the way in SoCal. And also, when the book launches next month, I will be doing some appearances, reading from the book, interviewing people from the scene, just trying to find out where exactly we're going to do it. I kind of sort of want to do it. If you watched the show I did a while back uh, while I was visiting my son you saw a bunch of guitars on the walls at uh buddy greg's studio we might do it there or maybe where i talk about where i lived for so long soundway studios can have you guys come out and hang out there which is a treasure treasure trove of bay area music history so not exactly sure as soon as i find out that will definitely be up but tonight we're going to talk about opioids the myths around opioids and harm reduction we recently did a show this past saturday discussing homeless sweeps in sf one of the main concerns of citizens and city governments was the open intravenous drug use of homeless citizens 
Many feel the solution is placing people in rehab facilities where abstaining from drugs is the solution, but is this the safest way? Harm reduction is still looked at as taboo in the drug rehabilitation community. It's not about making someone abstain from use and shaming them into treatment. But what is it about? The numbers say harm reduction keeps people alive and is cutting down on overdoses, but at what cost? What does that quality of life look like? I have some people that have worked in the field with firsthand experience here to discuss. Definitely returning guests. We have from it's not all in your head podcast decoy it's not just in your head uh, you know what just change the name god damn it <laughs> why do you have to be so difficult just change the goddamn name sorry can you say the name again since i have it up oh it's not just in your head okay. now i feel bad it's okay I don't want to get yelled at. Now, you know what? Now, I'm never going back on the show again. Now, you guys are like, fuck that guy. <laughs> say my name right now. Uh, say my name. Say my name. Speaking of saying names, uh, he's been on this show, Jesus, for like the last couple of years. Dr. Eric Osgood. Thank you for having me back on again. Thank you guys for agreeing to do this. And thank you for adding another expert in this field. Do you want to introduce Dr. Solman? Eric? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Dr. Solman and I connected briefly um, when I uh, hit him up for a sort of a free uh, curbside consult that, that he was kind enough to provide me uh, when it came to transitioning uh, from one uh a medication uh, assisted treatment to another and I started following his work. He has a great podcast uh, talking about a whole wide range of mental health topics. He works um, in, uh, my understanding is he works with the Washington Wizards as their like, official team uh, mental health expert, has spoken to a whole bunch of uh, experts on a wide range of topics from harm reduction, destigmatization of mental health care, uh, Ta uh, taking on the anti-psychiatry movement and mm. also of course this topic that we're about to discuss now and i have found him to be a really great research uh, resource and somebody i'm really glad to have uh, found on uh, on x or twitter or whatever you want to call it uh dr sulman i'm uh, really glad he was able to join us and uh, provide some of his expertise as somebody who um has a little bit more, a lot, I should say, a lot more formal training in this area as someone who's triple board certified, I believe, in adult and adolescent psych and addiction medicine, and I think is going to be a wealth of useful information. Um, I'm really glad he's able to join us. Dr. Salman, please welcome. <laughs> Bam. Yes, yes. Thank you guys for having me on. I well, know, I mean, with a resume, a brief, look, <laughs> that was a with a resume little, like that. Right. I, we had to have you on with a resume like that. Also, excuse me, were you with the Wizards when Gilbert Arenas was there? No, so, <laughs> that was before my time or else, you know, we could have uh, could have saved him potentially. Well, he's he, speaking of podcasts. He's got a podcast that sometimes for no good reason I watch. And I don't know why, but uh, former players have some interesting things to say about the league. <laughs> well, I won't get into, you know, what you do there. Because I think this conversation is pretty is pretty important. Um, I just I said it on the show Saturday, and I said this while we were off air. There is a bill that will be voted on SB forty nine here in California that uh, expands the parameters for being able to involuntarily commit people into facilities if they are addicted to opioids. Ultimately, um, the way we see problems is to you know put it away, crush it. <laughs> that's the, the destroy all problems right first and foremost what is harm reduction and how is it different than the abstinence model I Dr. Can go. oh Eko, you want to go first ladies I'll first, go first. I'll okay go ladies ahead. first bam um i think one of the biggest myths around harm reduction and abstinence only uh, treatment or abstinence-based treatment is that it's seen as opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. When it's when harm reduction, so 
what the difference is that harm reduction is a very expansive view of treating the person. Um, abstinence only treatment is a much narrow, narrower scope of treating a very specific problem. Am I making sense? Yeah. Uh, right. And so it's not, you know, it's not opposed to each other. It's just that with abstinence only treatment, that is the only option you have is abstinence. Right. Versus harm reduction is we will try to do the best. So what it is, is more of a patient slash client centered care where we provide services at all levels mm -hmm. and not just for people who are wanting to completely quit. Okay. Um, so that is, but, you know, again, like we link harm reduction services, link people to abstinence-based treatment all the time. So we, it is not, you know, I think the one thing that I really hate is when these things are kind of set in false opposition to each other, when it's a very different scope and approach to a problem, but harm reduction absolutely incorporates any kind of treatment that the client or patient is interested in. Can you give us an example or anybody want to give us an example of what harm reduction kind of looks like? I think a pragmatic example in, in practice that I might come across is uh, as opposed to sort of imposing externally particular goals onto a patient or a client or depending on what your profession is, what you might call the person that you're working with, um, the bottom line goal is quite literally to reduce harm. And so if you look back in much earlier, a couple of decades ago, which when there was a very different sort of zeitgeist behind the way this problem was approached, you say, let's say I'm working in a, in a clinic that prescribes medications like Suboxone and Subutex, which are medicines to basically help people not have cravings and withdrawal and uh, essentially help them live their lives and, uh, and abstain from some of the other you know, medications that they might've been getting on the street, heroin, whatever. And uh, they're coming in and they're taking drug tests and, you know, the presence of morphine metabolites or like heroin or, or things are coming in their urine screen. And that might be looked at, oh, this person keeps relapsing. Oh, there's a treatment failure. We got to do something and maybe wagging your finger at the person or, or maybe expressing some level of disappointment that it's not working versus a harm reduction model might say, look, if this person's not ready to give up on that yet. You know, we can obviously try to encourage that. We can maybe discuss that person's goals, meet where they're at. But if being on this clinic and getting this medication from me is allowing them to maybe only do that once or twice a week, as opposed to seven days a week, three, four times a day, you have now cut their, you know, amount of times that a hypodermic needle is going into their arm down by like 75%. You are allowing them to function well enough to start gainfully employment and overall improving their quality of life. And the other problem with the first model is now that person might feel ashamed, not want to come into your office, not want to follow up with you because they don't want to face you. And now they are in a situation that's more dangerous. And so it really largely in practice is about, you know, number one, being not judgmental. And number two, having a goal that quite literally just can sort of quantify, is this approach going to put them less in harm's way than the alternate and not letting the, uh, you know, the imperfect, you know, um, be the be the enemy of how does the phrase go again? Not letting the uh, progress be the enemy of perfection. Uh, I think that's one way that plays out in clinical practice. From more of like a macro uh, standpoint, harm reduction policy to me m is more about uh, compassion and, uh, and at a more systemic or macro level, not imposing uh, sort of puritanical values or social conservative values onto people where they're not supposed to be doing behavior X, Y, Z and getting them to stop. Uh, focusing on getting people at these absence programs versus, again, meeting people where they are, providing them the resources uh, that they need to do engage in whatever behavior that, that they're engaging in in the most safe way possible. Um, and that's really what the term harm reduction ultimately comes down to for me. And kind of like a, a, a bigger level is that we have harm reduction policies in so many different parts of life that we're trying to apply it now, or at least the discussion is about like opioids and, you know, we have the opioid crisis and epidemic that's there. We have harm reduction in cars, right? So when cars, automobiles started out, then 
more and more prevalence of those we were getting car accidents and people were dying from car accidents and getting thrown out the window and other uh, situations that occur. So a harm reduction policy to that situation is we're going to put seatbelts in the cars. We're going to enforce having to wear seatbelts. We're going to have laws that are there so that people have to use seatbelts. We start doing airbags. That's essentially harm reduction for automobiles, which was for so, so many years, you know, and continues to be one of the major uh, causes of death in the world as a whole. The other kind of thing is, you know, we look at it for, you can apply this as well to sex. Um, Mm -hmm. Because there's inherently there's risks that come along with sex, things like STDs, pregnancies, etc, all these things that can occur from sex. So when the HIV, the AIDS epidemic was really roaring in the 90s, and I, you know, grew up in the 90s, I was a class of 2000 for high school, you know, and I went to a Catholic uh, grade school, you know, it was all very much like absence, absence, absence. And if you like, have sex, you're going to get AIDS and you're going to have all these AIDS babies and you're going to die from it. So that's that was kind of the, the message that was getting taught to us. And what was happening is you have the HIV epidemic, all these things. And then once we start to kind of shift to that to be like, well, wear a condom or practice safe sex or all these other things, we right. notice that this doesn't become much of a problem. And that is, again, applying a harm reduction approach towards this solution or this situation. So the idea is that when we talk about it for substances, we know throughout the whole of human existence, right? Since humans have been on this earth, that humans have tried to alter their reality, alter their perception in some way, shape or form, whether that's through alcohol or peyote or anything else, cannabis, whatever else is out there. And this is just the newest thing right now. And the only reason it's getting more attention is because there's greater risk that comes along with it. And you have higher risks of, we have an unsafe supply. So the idea is that we're trying to apply this model now to say, we just don't want people to die, right? And that's what it comes down to versus, because we right. know with abstinence models, right? Abstinence-based models, they fail. Over 90% of the time when someone goes to an abstinence-based rehab or detox center, doesn't work and they come back so that's why they keep calling these things uh what is called like revolving doors they're like you know a lot of times when i was going through training it was like well we'll see you next time we'll see you next time right and it wasn't there was no message of hope and you know that was going on so that's where now this movement has come up to be like we have to understand we have to realize that people are going to use substances let's just make sure that we have things like safe consumption sites or let's see what else we need to do let's work on a safe supply We've done right. that with or alcohol. People exchange, right? right? Yeah, you know, providing like providing that, right? safe yeah. equipment is, I guess, part of you know safe consumption sites. But well, right. when we talk um, about this, this is my next question. I, I do want to get into this. When we say these things like safe consumption sites, safe injection sites, they sound very nice and pretty, and like they just work. Like someone comes in and they get a needle or whatever else they need, and they walk out. But the reality is that these places don't always look like that they do become kind of hubs for illicit activities because that's the world that we're inviting in there we have to be honest about that um a lot of people don't want to live near these things and we call them nimbies i don't know if that's necessarily fair i don't know how you guys feel about that because i don't know too many people that are like dude i totally want to live near where people are shooting up um so much fun uh, how can we improve the conditions of these places? Um, well, one of the, oh, go ahead. One of the major things, you know, and the the DEA and the FDA is kind of a huge um, obstacle in many ways because one of the major fallouts of the opioid epidemic has been for you know people that need it, you know, chronic pain patients, um, etc. But one of the major, you know, with opioids getting such a crackdown from the DEA in terms of like physicians' ability to prescribe, you know, that makes something like, you know, more accessible methadone because I'm a huge fan of methadone treatment. But the way we treat methadone patients in this country is absolutely abysmal. Mm-hmm. You know, the um, clinics are 
open very short limited hours you know there's always long lines i mean especially for people who are working shift jobs and and you know have very little leeway in terms of like time flexibility methadone is almost a recipe for failure not because the medication doesn't work but because of the way that is limited in this country. So I think one of the things that we can absolutely do in terms of, because I consider methadone to be part of the safe consumption aspect, right, um, is being able to expand access at like pharmacies and doctor's offices. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, we have safe consumption sites all over this country right now. They're called bars. Right. For alcohol, yes. Right, right. Yeah, so, um, and hey, you know, fist fights break out at bars. And, and anyway, um, I think before we even start talking about safe consumption, um, uh, Dr. Sullivan brought up a really interesting point, and, and that was safe supply. And unfortunately, the way that from the DEA, but from sort of the top down from, from the federal government in general, that ha every, at every step of the way, the worst possible decision has been made to basically maximize harm as opposed to reduce harm. Uh, bring, up the, bring up the HIV epidemic, uh, you know, around that time was when Nich Richard Nixon sort of launched this all-out offensive against the great this nation's threat, drug abuse, blah, blah, blah. What did they do? Well, they started, well, let's just drastically cut down on people's supply of needles so people can't shoot up. What happens? People start sharing more needles, and that coincides with the rise, the very early stage of the HIV epidemic. Uh, you know, fast forward to the point where throughout the 80s, early 90s, started seeing more and more uh, prescription for opioids to treat pain. Uh, that, of course, was accelerated as OxyContin was released in the in the mid uh, to late 1990s. Uh, a lot of, of sort of boom in prescriptions. And then the sort of sudden halt and the pendulum sort of swung the other way from pain is the fifth vital sign, you're a terrible doctor if you don't give your patient opioids to this extremely opiophobic uh, restrictive state. That happened at the same time that, you know, uh, the Afghanistan war and wiping up the Taliban were all of a sudden all these poppy fields that have been getting eradicated for years booming. And now we have this heroin boom into the country. And now people are in a state where they've gotten used to having pretty readily, easily supply of you know, pills that they might have been getting through diversion or prescription or whatever, they're cut off now. They're up to spending maybe a dollar a milligram, if not more, potentially five, six hundred dollars a day. And then it's, oh, you can get this forty dollar bag and that'll basically take care of your needs for the day. Now people are converting over to heroin. Now you fast forward even further, the heroin supply due to the sort of the global war on drugs, crackdowns at the border, et cetera, et cetera. Now the presence and the availability of heroin coming into the country is significantly reduced that coincides with first off china basically selling a lot of the uh, pre legal precursors for the synthetic the synthesis of fentanyl uh subsequently the ability of some of the drug operations and cartels to synthesize uh, fentanyl and we're now starting to see uh samples of heroin that have very high levels of fentanyl in it which i'm sure we'll get into uh to the point where most of what people are buying out there contain does not even contain heroin anymore it's just straight up fentanyl Again, severe crackdowns and reductions at the hands of the DEA of legal prescriptions where they've just come in and said, OK, pharmacies, we're, we're just straight up limiting how much medication you can order every month, meaning people can come in with completely legitimate prescriptions and just not be able to find their medicine anymore. And that comes at a time where we're seeing a huge proliferation of drug operations purchasing pill pressers and using uh, fentanyl products to make counterfeit pills. And now people are turning to that. And so what we've done is create an extremely unsafe supply. So before we even start talking about safe consumption sites, we have to start rethinking policy to make a safe supply so that people can utilize these medications as they see fit without potentially getting an unintentional dose that is way too high, which is what the current crisis is being driven by and causing all these uh, all these deaths, is that the supply is unsafe. And the sort of prohibition um, crackdown uh, it, uh, approach the, to, to limiting supply has basically made that metastasize worse and worse and worse at every step of the way same thing with like cocaine and now we have methamphetamines like every time they try to crack down from the supply side they have caused this problem to metastasize into something wor worse and now before we can even talk really about safe consumption we have a major crisis with safe supply
And right. is, isn't that kind of the main problem that we, we have here with, with this whole conversation is that you have kind of citizens that, that aren't having this conversation. You know, you, especially if you live in a major metropolitan area, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. I was in San Francisco recently and they have had a big crackdown. We, again, we talked about that Saturday. Please go watch that show if you, I can't get into the minutia of what's going on in San Francisco, but there has been sweeps that have kind of been called on by the citizens for a crackdown on drug use because much like we saw with crack cocaine in the 80s and 90s, which gives you the 99 to 1 disparity in the courts, I believe we're seeing the same thing with fentanyl where it is the end all be all. Uh, unlike with crack, you know, it's, it's, it's turning mothers into street whores. Now we have fentanyl. It's just killing everybody. If you see it, you're going to die. So what do you guys think about, uh, I don't want to say the demonization of fentanyl, but kind of the, and, I, and I've seen Ecoy, you talk about this. Um, the demonization of pain medication. Right, pain, pain, pain management is a right, <laughs> in my opinion. You know, and and the right to comfort is absolutely essential. But I mean, fentanyl in you know medical use is legitimate medicine, and I am actually kind of really upset to see any any medication really, you know, unfairly demonized. Um, because fentanyl in medical, you know, setting surgery, um, for, you know, severe pain in terms of like, you know, end stage cancer, et cetera, it is literally a quality of life slash lifesaver. Right. But, you know, the issue with safe supply has been that street supply has never been safe. It's never been safe my entire <laughs> life. This is nothing new. Right. Um, I'm, you know, nearing 50. And so a lot of my first opioid epidemic was in the 90s where I lost a lot of friends. And, you know, that was the same issue back then because street supply, you don't know your dose like you would with a pharmaceutical drug. Right. Um, that's, and that's, that's, that's always okay. been an, an issue in street drugs that's always been a huge risk in street drugs and i think fentanyl ups the ante because of its potency right. but it's not a new issue a lot of people kind of pretend like this fentanyl thing is like this brand new, you know brand new thing and it's like no this has always been an issue in street drugs and that's why harm reduction has always called for safe supply for a very long time this is not new I've been around harm reduction circles for, you know, decades at this point. And that this is not a new call. We've been making this call for a long time. Dr. Sloma? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I use this analogy a lot of times for people is that when you go to McDonald's and you, you know, I'm in, in Virginia and I go to McDonald's and if I order a Big Mac and then if I travel across the country and I want to visit you in California or anywhere else, like, right, I order the same Big Mac. I know what I'm getting. I'm getting the same thing on, you know, by coast or Texas or wherever the hell I go. It's a whole different story when we're buying, when something has been made illicit and we have to buy it through illicit quote unquote means from the guy in the corner or somewhere else there where you can go to one person and get something that you think is going to be cannabis or you think it's going to be a Xanax or you think it's going to be a bag of heroin. You go down you know, 10 feet, 15 feet, or even just like the next bag, right? You buy it, you know, the next day. And it's a whole different thing despite it being marketed the same. So it's the quality control. And that's where the problem is. And fentanyl or even just even opioids in general is the, the lethal potential, the potential lethal dose is so narrow. That's where the really, the risk comes in. And that's again, where we right. talk about harm reduction is we want to say like, if you knew, right, if you knew that you're getting this amount of heroin or this amount of fentanyl or this amount of meth, whatever it is, you knew that every time you used it, that you're getting that much, the risk goes down. Because, you know, the majority of people are not who are having these these overdose deaths is like they're not going out with the intention of doing that. Right. There, I mean, of course, there are going to be some of them that are. But are, is someone going to be like today's the day that I'm going to accidentally overdose and die from this? Of course not. 
Um, and a lot of that, again, it, it comes down to just quality control and not knowing what's and what they're taking. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I see a lot of people in the more community based. Well, I guess all this is not all, but a lot of this is community based because a lot of this doesn't get state funding, um, especially where I'm from. Uh, and they give out things like drug testing kits. And I've always questioned the reality of addicts using drug testing kits. They do. I'm, not, I'm not saying don't use them. Uh, do. Don't give them out. I, I mean, maybe the ones you guys have been around. The the problem, Jason, is that, and I think 48 states uh, they have they have kits that are inexpensive, readily available that you can use that will give you a, be able to gauge the supply of the product and get an idea of the potency and the presence of fentanyl. It's mm -hmm. considered uh, illegal drug paraphernalia and I yes. believe 48 out of 50 states. So, yes. I mean, one very simple example of harm reduction would be to do away with that. It serves no purpose. It's completely mm -hmm. irrational policy and um, would allow for, again, like, you know, this isn't just applied to opioids. Somebody may be buying what they think is Adderall, right? Because mm -hmm they're in college and all of a sudden because of DEA crackdowns, they take their Adderall prescription to the pharmacy and the pharmacy is like, we don't have it. When are you going to have it? I don't know. Not for the rest of the month. We can't order anymore because of these new rules. So they go buy some and it's basically fake press stuff that probably just has methamphetamine, but they're using the same thing to press some of the other counterfeit pills and getting small amounts of fentanyl into these pills for people that are opioid naive, meaning they don't have any tolerance. And, uh, a very, very simple thing that you could do would be to allow those to be legal. And if somebody is getting a pill from any source that's not a pharmacy, they'd be able to apply that test and know if they're getting a counterfeit product that contains fentanyl. That'd be a very easy way to save lives. Um, yeah. uh, it's completely irrational policy to, to have those actually be illegal and not be able to utilize them and distribute them. Yes. The main issue, um, well, I'll just kind of jump in real fast, is like the main issue is that we have policymakers who have no idea what the hell is going on, um, who are totally divorced and separate from the science, from the medicine, from the pharmacology behind all of this stuff. You have people who are, you know, 80 year old people who are having like, you know, uh, mini strokes on TV, right? Who are having, creating policies that say things like, well, all drugs are bad and you should not use them. And therefore anything to do with drugs is no good. And people like us who are like, no, we're actually on the streets. Well, maybe, maybe not we're on the streets, but you know, we're actually working with people who are, who are using this every day and they have a better idea of what's going on and we're able to use then hopefully our voice to kind of educate people. But we're not part of the conversations, right? Because we don't have money behind us. We don't have any other thing that comes along with there. So our voices are not heard. Um, and then the policies are made by people who just, again, don't know what's going on when we talk I about think that's you know, deliberate yeah oh absolutely it's, deliberate. it's, it's, absolutely it's intentional deliberate. yeah oh no doubt there's a hundred percent that you know these things are are by design none of this stuff happens by accident um you know erica talked about before the medication buprenorphine or suboxone subutex whatever the names is absolved well, it has these different brand names are out there earlier in the year you know so this just kind of a real basic, basic kind of pharmacology lesson. This is a medication that was developed to um, as a pain medication, but it works a little bit different from other opioids. It is an opioid itself, but it works as what's called a partial agonist. So that means you cannot overdose on it. And there is something that's called a ceiling effect that goes into effect with it. And this is the medication that we use. You know, you, you referenced um, methadone before. This has become the outpatient medication right. that we use on a daily basis so you don't have to go every day to a methadone clinic you can see your doc once a month and get this take take this home and you can live your life and you know be having your without having to do withdrawals and cravings and all that part of it only you know since this came out there was so much concern about it being that like oh people are just you know diverting this medication and it's illegally being used i was like the majority of the people who are quote unquote again illegally using this medication or diverting this medication is because there are people who are on the streets who are selling it or giving it to other people who need it, <laughs> who, who, who are who are friends right. or family members of people who are going through withdrawals and being like, hey, here's a medication that can get you out of withdrawals. 
and not having you to go out back to heroin or whatever else that's out there. So this is a medication, again, something that would be that there was so much opposition for that only just in the past year in May, March that people were able to be like, you don't need a special license anymore to prescribe this. You don't need to do all these other things, do all these hoops that are there for this medication that is literally, it is my favorite medication, <laughs> right? That I prescribe. It is a life-saving medication and it makes a difference like that. Um, and that's just, again, the, the lack of education, the lack of people who know what the hell they're doing. Why do you think uh, governments are so, you said it's by design. Why do you think you know, state and, and uh, federal governments are against this? Um, against, like, sane drug policy? <laughs> <laughs> Why are they against sane drug I mean, policy? me personally, I think, I think addicts are a great tool to use. They're great scapegoats. Yeah, right. yeah. For which, and it's bipartisan. It's a, they're bipartisan mm -hmm. tools, right? If you don't, if oh, you yeah. have a heart, you know, we'll have some sort of, uh, you know, look, we'll we'll build these walls. You don't have to see them, and you can stash them in there, right. and everyone will feel better. Yeah. Or again, like this new bill that is like, look, you have family that's addicted, and you want to help them, and they refuse to go, just force them into treatment. Mm -hmm. It's fine. So I I get yeah. it. I believe they're scapegoats, but when it comes down to, you know, things like. Uh, drug testing kits. Why is passing this out contraband outside of what is in New York and California? Like, why is this such a bad word in places where this is a massive problem? I've been down south in uh, Louisiana where, you know, I remember a show where like five people wanted to tell me their story about how they had one little backache and that turned into a heroin addiction. Definitely in the Rust Belt. Um, mm -hmm. I, I saw this um definitely back east in in the new england area where it's really bad um i saw this um why 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 well are... go ahead i have a i mean one we you know one one of the biggest negative aspects i think about same drug policy is you know a very clear misunderstanding of what addiction is Right. You know, because in the colloquial understanding of drugs, especially in the United States, you know, it is about the drug, whether it's opioid or meth or cocaine or crack. But the focus is on the substance when addiction is fundamentally about people's relationship to whatever it is. Usually drugs are a symptom, not a cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You and know, there are... yeah, oh, okay, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I thought you paused. I thought you were done. I don't want to cut you off, please. Oh, um, and that, you, I mean, because, you know, people can have, people can develop eating disorders. Eating disorders have a lot of similarities to, you know, substance use disorders, for example. So it is about the relationship. And one of the major things about why drug policy is always fixated on criminalization and supply constraints in the United States is because this is a country that doesn't necessarily want people to develop healthy communities, doesn't want to support social welfare, doesn't want to support you know, affordable rent and healthy communities and healthy schools and all these social requirements of a healthy society that would go so far to prevent yeah. not just drug addiction, but, you know, a whole slew of like physical and mental health issues. Right. That, you know, drugs are kind of like always shuttered off into like, you know, its own corner as a redheaded stepchild. But, you know, it's it's part of, you know, people's mental and physical conditions that people suffer from when they are in traumatized and unhealthy situations. Yeah. Sure. And yet I think it's, it's since we're on the topic of myths, and I think one of the myths around this drug class in particular, as well as others, is that people look at it like, oh, it's this stuff that just intrinsically just gets its hooks in you. And anybody that takes it is going to be at risk. And the fact of the matter is that not everyone's brain is wired the same. And I'm sure Dr. Sulman uh, was, will, will have a wealth of knowledge in this topic. But um, not, I would say that basically there's people who, yes, um, in response to the ingestion of this substance, have a what's called a, a favorable limbic or positive limbic response, an exaggerated sense of well-being, a sense of euphoria. 
But other people actually if, actually experience dysphoria when they ingest that drug class. They feel really terrible. Uh, their mood becomes bad. They might become physically ill. And then about another probably third of people are actually pretty limbic neutral. It doesn't really cause euphoria or dysphoria. And some colleagues of mine back in 2008 published a retrospective case control study where we tried to understand the difference between people who start off taking medication, these medications for pain, and end up going one way or the other. And we looked at a whole different range and host of factors. And basically what we found is that it really comes down to the subjective effect that one feels when taking the medication. And so it's sort of a myth that it's an intrinsic property of the medication that it's a risk to anybody that takes it. It's, it's just part of the property of this drug is that it puts its hooks into you and it's going to get you like, no, that's not really how any right. drug works. We, it's a, it's a complex biopsychosocial phenomenon and different people are wired differently and potentially have different drug of choice that they might be at risk for. So um, I think right. what happens is the policy becomes so broad rather than using a scalpel, they use a machete and it's just all about treating it widespread and just, we're going to cut down. We see too many prescriptions. We think it's too many. We're just going to cut down and not allow that many. We're going to make these steps and these hurdles that pain patients have to go through in order to get their medication because somehow that's overall going to help more people than it harms. When in reality, people just, it just to drives their- overdoses. It drives overdoses. It stigmatizes people. You talk to anybody that has to go to a pharmacy to treat chronic pain who's on any Schedule II uh, opioid medication, they will tell you how stigmatized they feel, the way that pharmacy staff looks at them and treats them and talks to them. The fact that current rules make it so that they quite literally, you have to basically run out of your medication before you are eligible to go pick up more every single month. You're in a position, if it's around the clock, obviously there's physical dependence. If you suddenly stop taking that medication, it's going to be extremely unpleasant. And because of these rules, like I don't ever want anybody to run out of their insulin or their Norvasc or their Plavix or these other medications I use for cardiovascular disease. I'm going to make sure they have plenty of refills. And if they can't get to the pharmacy when the next month starts, they can keep taking it. With this drug class, the rules in place are like, no, 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 you cannot fill your next prescription, get your next supply until you've almost taken the last one that you have. And you're putting people in these cycles every single month of the trauma of having to hope that their mm-hmm. pharmacy is not out of it. Hope maybe something doesn't come up where they can't get to the pharmacy that day. Now it's the weekend. They have to order it or you got to go away on a trip or there's a death in the family or whatever. And, and uh, there's a lot of collateral damage that happens to people who simply want to get medical care that, as you said, is a right. It's a, it's a right to be treated right. humanely and to have your discomfort treated And because of this sort of prohibitionist, moralizing sort of puritanical view that our country's leaders have always had towards substances, going back as far as prohibition, cannabis, alcohol, um, there's this sense of, well, this stuff is bad. And, you know, we want to really make sure we crack down. And it's all done in the name of safety, but really it's safety theater and it causes a lot of collateral harm. And then, of course, you have, unfortunately, people being put in more risky situations quite the opposite of harm reduction it's really harm maximalization uh the other last thing i want to say and i I don't want to talk too much but we talked about how sort of the forced abstinence model doesn't work outcomes research actually shows that it's actually more dangerous than not doing anything at all yeah um just letting people be and go on about whatever they're doing uh because again the almost the most vulnerable person can be they come out of one of these uh institutions where they've basically been spun down to not have tolerance anymore uh, the craving doesn't go away. The you know the desire to be in or you know being in that milieu or whatever. And now people sometimes will acknowledge, okay, my tolerance is a little bit less, but often gets overestimated. And this is where overdoses happen. This is where uh, this is where people that end up being found some... dead in their cars or in their basements or whatever. Uh, yeah. This is it's very very dangerous. And then you you were kind enough to send me an article recently where um, in the Lancet there they was published the XBOT trial, which quite landmark famously demonstrated that Vivitrol, this long acting blocker that was sometimes used in like drug court settings where you get injected with medicine that basically makes opioids not be able to work on you and how there was basically no more danger or, or, or more safety signal than say something like Suboxone or Subutex. It turns out they miscalculated the overdose deaths and it turns out it's like more than two times more likely to cause fatal overdoses. And that really, be, yeah. yeah. Let me ask you guys a quick question about that. So there is uh, this thing that we have in some areas called drug courts, and yeah. some people look at them as a good tool to divert people into the prison system. I think 
one of the things that people like saying, because they, again, they don't really work in this world or live in this world, is that people want to lock people up. And it's like, mm, yes and no. First of all, especially if you live in a major metropolitan area, cops really don't want to deal with people that are going to be, be, if you're covered in feces, they don't really want you in the car. They don't really want to deal with you. They will at best tell you to move along. Um, and also, there's constantly people trying to find ways to keep people out of prisons because you have an overcrowding problem with prisons, especially in places like California. Again, we said this before. Right. Sure. Maybe we have to say it again. That is why in, I believe, 2010, uh, the law was changed for what grand theft was, what could be a felony. That's why you see those kids running in stores and running out with all this stuff. It was under, I think it was $1,000 or $950 or whatever it was for the merchandise. You know, no one's going to arrest you for, for that. It's a misdemeanor um, because people were literally dying in overcrowded prisons for, for lack of care, not getting, thing, like, <laughs> not getting their insulin or, or checkups when they were sick. So the idea that this is just good for this prison system and also we have to look at, you know, what facilities are being built? Facilities are being built to hold immigrants all over the country. That's a that's a that's a multi billion yeah. dollar industry. So, uh, how do you guys feel about drug courts or care courts in some places? It's called as well. It's a mixed bag. You know, because I think it can. It, I mean, I know people that have gone to drug courts that have done well. Um, and that did appreciate the process that they went through. And, and I also know, you know, at least the same amount of number where it was extremely traumatizing. You know, they don't necessarily, I mean, I'll, one of the major issues with drug courts is that most rehabs, and I'm going to say something controversial, but most rehabs are fucking scams. They're not real nope, treatment. No argument. No argument for me. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, it's punitive. It's dehumanizing. People are, you know, constantly condescended to. It's, it's not a supportive environment. The vast majority of it is, you know, for profit or at least the owners, you know, by state contract, whatever. They're making a lot of money on it, you know, so in a environment where the treatment that people have access to have very little quality control, right? You know, diverting them from jail to substandard treatment isn't, it, you know, it's like, yeah, it's better than jail, but also are we actually solving the problem? We're not. Sorry. So I was just going to say, I, I look at it as kind of like the deinstitutionalization of psychiatric hospitals back in like the 1960s. Everybody was like all up in the arm. They're like, oh my goodness, we have these psychiatric asylums and these huge hospitals and they're doing all these atrocities and terrible things that are there. And I'm not arguing that those things didn't happen. They absolutely did happen and you know, something needed to be done. So the idea was like, we're gonna deinstitutionalize. We're gonna get all these people, we're gonna shut these places down and free everybody, right? And where do they all go? Where do they end up going is into the prisons. The idea behind everything, or they ended up unhoused or homeless, whatever you want to say. The idea was that you're going to have community supports out there. And you're going to have um, community social workers and care managers and doctors and a whole team that's going to take care of these people once we get out of the state hospital. But the money wasn't there. Right, the politicians, the people who are allocating the funds, didn't put the money into these situations. So then we end up in these situations where we're like, all right, we've shut down the state hospital, great. But where do the people go? And then where are they going to get their care? Where are they going to get their medication? Where are they going to get their meals? Family doesn't necessarily want them to be home, so they go out into the prison system or they go out to the streets or whatever. It's the same thing that happens with the drug court: is you. A drug court is a great idea in, in, in theory, but if your resources theory. aren't there, you're right. And if you don't have the support in place, the referrals that you make are not going to be evidence based, right? We're not going to use these evidence based models. We're just going to say, well, you have to get your, like you mentioned before, the Vivitrol shot, right? Or you have to go to a 12 step program, or you have to do abstinence only treatment. 
that's where the failures come in. That's where, again, when we don't look and see, hey, patient X, where are you at in your journey with what it, with your relationship with substances? What do you want that to be? Do you want a relationship or do you not want their relationship? When we don't meet them where they're at, this is where we have outcome failures, essentially. Right. Yes. Yeah. Meeting where they're at, I think, is the best way to put it. And when you talk about drug court, what you're basically saying is when somebody um, is, say, arrested or comes in contact with law enforcement for something that is drug related, it's meant to be a way to not put them into the carceral system, not to incarcerate them, put them behind bars, but rather to put them into sort of a court supervised program where so long as they meet particular requirements, go to certain group meetings, meet with a psychotherapist or psychiatrist, take prescribed medications, whether that might be a long acting antagonist or partial agonist treatment, so suboxone, something like that, and pass drug tests. And as long as they're able to make these different steps, they're able to remain in the community, keep working, not be in the carceral state. But if they fail, then they end up in prison. And while that's probably a step in, a, in the right direction in terms of like putting people in prison, it's still based on the fundamental notion that we are criminalizing this, right? The right. fact that, okay, like, you, you have a person who went and stopped by the, the dealer's house, grabbed a few bags or whatever, drove home, cops saw them coming out of a high crime area, pulled them over on a pretextual stop for a stop sign or whatever, searched the car, got the dogs out, found the baggies. Okay, now you are entering into the criminal justice system because we societally have decided that this behavior is criminal, that this substance is criminal, and we now have to intervene for you. It's still a deprivation of civil rights. It's still basically taking someone's own agency away and forcing them through the hand of the court into particular programs that they may or may not want to be a part of versus if we changed our focus to why should this person have to go to some shady drug house to buy something that they have no control over if they want to use this substance? Why can't we put systems in place to obviate the need for that? So if somebody wants to, to consume that type of thing, there's a safe way for them to do it that's regulated and going to prevent deaths. And if they've had enough, they don't like the side effects, they don't like being constipated all the time, they don't like the hypogonadism effect or just whatever it might be, and they want to get out of it and have some treatment options, it's available to them and uh, provided to them in more of a voluntary basis uh, with with their desire to do so and not being imposed upon them, which is really the only way for effectiveness. So while, yeah, they're, they're sort of a step in the right direction, they're still based on a fundamentally wrong way of looking at this problem, in my opinion. Right. And it's also a huge waste of money mm -hmm. in the sense that possession doesn't mean addiction, Right. right. You know, and so many people end up in drug court spending so much of like the state's money and time and everything, not because they have a drug problem, but like a lot of people were caught unlucky with drugs. Mm -hmm. Just because you have drugs on you doesn't mean that you have a substance use disorder. And the drug court is kind of indiscriminate in that way. Right. Well. I do want to, you know, we're coming to the end of the hour and I want to say thank you guys so much for uh, spending some time and talking with me today. And I do want to end with one question that's probably going to take us a little over the hour. Um, and we talked about it a little bit off air. It's the rehab industry and body brokers. Yeah, Michael um, K. Williams was in that movie. He was in the movie. I mean, I'm talking about the, the literal people. Uh, oh, okay, and, yeah. And, and Michael K. Williams played... Sadly, a person that was a body broker who also did drugs themselves, uh, even in the article that Eric gave me about these people, um, a lot of them do come from the mm -hmm. rehabilitation world, former addicts themselves. Um, the, the rehabilitation industry is just that. It's an industry. And during the Obama administration, when opioid overdose deaths were on the rise, uh, PPOs made it easy for people to get into recovery programs. Uh, but there has been a manipulation of that system that is creating, quote, body brokers, people who send other addicts to rehab facilities kind of far away from where they're located, usually in places like Florida, uh, where they get a fee for the person because the rehab facility is making so much money from the insurance company. Um, and these facilities are pretty much providing substandard care, pocketing the insurance money. Uh, it's a very lucrative industry. Can you guys talk a little bit more about this model? Probably 
explain it better than than I can right now. Who wants to go first? Don't all answer at once. Dr. <laughs> Eric, I pick you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it, it's basically an exploitation. Uh, I mean, there, there are all sorts of different schemes where people have found ways to build money out of private or, or public like Medicare uh, in order to line their pockets. And this is just one of them, basically taking advantage of an underserved problem and uh, funneling money by basically funneling people toward these programs. And so they would basically uh, come in contact and advertise and find people that you know, we want to get into rehab bed or struggling. Say, hey, just give us all your contact info, you know, give us all your information, sometimes SSN number or insurance if you, if you have it. And these people would basically broker plans with insurance providers to get them to pay for and cover uh, rehab beds and they would send them off. Typically it would be to somewhere like Florida um, so you're kind of like whisked away from wherever you are. You're going down to Florida and don't have a heck of a lot of a say in where you're going to go with the quality of that facility or what quality of services they provide, the qualifications of the people that are actually running it. And mm-hmm. half the time, it's just people who were just in it for the money, maybe people who had formerly uh, used issues themselves, whatever it may be. And they're just having these houses where multiple people are living there. They're maybe doing some like, yes, silver homes. Today. yeah, silver homes basically. And, you know, it, it basically not qualified to, in, in a lot of cases to actually be managing these people, not engage in any sort of evidence-based practice to help them out, uh, access to unsupervised visits off site. And unfortunately it becomes one of those situations where people then find themselves in the same social milieu uh, away from family and friends and in, in risky situations where they could end up basically overdosing. And it's like, Oh, well, and, and it just basically becomes this cottage industry where the brokers were lining their pockets, the people running these sober homes for profit were lining their profits. And it just became either a revolving door or just you know, basically a funnel into morgues because people were dying. And unfortunately somebody, I was friendly with growing up uh, fell victim to this and he was found dead in a van uh, somewhere in Florida. No one knew what happened to him. This was really during the sort of early phases when fentanyl and fentanyl analogs like car fentanyl and silk fentanyl were starting to become a problem. And at first I remember his loved ones started posting information and it was just odd that there were no opiates or any any other uh, drugs uh, in the system. And later uh, it it turned out that there was car fentanyl and that was the only drug found in his, in his system. And uh, that caused him to overdose and basically his, uh, the people that were with him who maybe they were his quote unquote friends, but didn't know him for very long, pretty much just left him. And he was just left there to die alone. And uh, this unfortunately is a very common story. Uh, and another example where the profit motive and just sort of, I guess, capitalism as a whole uh, puts uh, profits over, over people and, and, and over humanism. And uh under the guise of wanting to help people out, it just turns into these little mills where people get basically just turned into walking, talking, breathing cash registers, and not a lot of not a lot of uh, attention is paid to their uh, well being. And uh, unfortunately, there were there were victims and there were casualties uh, that that happened from this. Yes, um, one thing I will say also about the rehab industry and the labor aspect of the rehab industry is that it is often a captive industry for the employees um, Mm -hmm. because a lot of them are former users. A lot of them have, Mm -hmm. you know, felonies and criminal. um, It's the only place you can make money. If you have a big time felony conviction, Mm -hmm. if you, if you had to sit down in prison for 10 to 15 years, there's one place you can go and you can possibly, possibly earn a six figure living. And that's the rehab world or the nonprofit world. Right. And unfortunately, you know, the it's not that people are getting six figure incomes, right? People no, are no. getting paid minimum wage. They are burned out. They are, you know, under supervised, under trained. And I mean, one of the things about working in the industry is that it is an industry that is often full of extremely well-meaning people. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times if you know, one of the downsides of leaning strictly on personal experience a lot of times can be that 
your you know approach doesn't necessarily um isn't necessarily the best approach for a client mm -hmm. and they, it's also people that you know not again everybody's different but you know what i gather was it was people that have very low tolerance because they made it mm -hmm. so right well i, I mean agree. go ahead I don't think it's so much that like they've made it, it, they've made it, but it's also that like they've made it and they are now oftentimes for these people, this is the first time they've had authority and power. Mm -hmm. Right. And for people that have never, ever, like I know a lot of people in my field where they talk about this, where they're like, oh, yeah, like I never thought I would be in a place where like my word could send somebody back to prison. Mm. Yeah. Right. And there are people that are very cautious and respect that power. And there are too many that do not. And become extremely judgmental, extremely shaming. I mean, you know, one thing about working with clients directly in substance use disorder treatment is, you know, I try to, if they have, and many do have extensive treatment history, right? You know, so you go and talk to them and it's, it, yeah, it, it, I mean, the amount of trauma that people end up enduring in their multiple treatment rounds and itself is like oh well you know no wonder our problems getting worse when our treatments traumatizing people right that's, when you're that's... like yeah like when you're being like financially or sexually abused by your 12-step sponsor or <laughs> you know I, so many things you know i mean i i i have a very mixed again view of 12 steps you know for people that it yeah. helped it's great I like the fact that it's free and accessible to the community. Um, but, you know, there are, it is, it, it is not treatment. It is peer support. And like any peer yeah. support, there's going to be very, very questionable people with questionable intent. You leave Russell Brand out of this. Oh, but, man. So. I was just, yeah, just going to say like that, that stigma, that stigma never really goes away. You know, and even with the people who make it, quote unquote, make it, mm -hmm. that comes back and that stigma comes back. And it's like, well, well, look at me. I've made it. And look at you, junkie addicts. Like, uh, you guys, again, we're talking about the power dynamics that are there. That right. The quote unquote, junkie addicts, right? That it, it comes up. Even, you know, they're like, I've done it. I've done it. That's like, no, you guys have to do it too. So it's always, always kind of there. And, and unless we're able to kind of, Again, the people who are on the other side, people who are providers who are supposed to be helping out, unless we're able to keep that in check and just be aware of the fact that like our internal biases, our internal stigmas are there and we need to be aware of those. It's going to show up in ways that we don't want it to. And unfortunately, when we're playing with people's lives, lives are at risk. Yep. Yeah. Mm. So you're you want the last word, doctor? That's uh, your, your counter-transference, right, doctor? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh thousand percent well look we've been talking for over an hour thank you guys so much um we could i feel comfortable feeling you know saying that we could talk probably another hour <laughs> there's definitely a lot of things i didn't get to ask you guys i did kind of want to ask you a little bit about 12 steps but we'll have to save that for another conversation for another time um thank you guys for for joining us thank you guys for watching if you guys like this if you find value and stuff like this Make sure you share shows like this. Tell people about this. I think these conversations. Nice meeting you, Dr. Solomon. Yeah, it's always great. nice yeah, talking like to you, Eric. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, really great speaking to everybody. Uh, I will be in the champagne room with M2 Sant. Uh, we'll definitely be taking your questions. I'm sure people will have some comments about the show. If you're not a patron, it's a great time to become one for as little as three dollars a month or thirty dollars for the year. You can have access to the champagne room, past and present our champagne room only call-in shows. You can be part of the live virtual audience for the Pascal Robert hosted Mau Mau Hour. And you can join us for movie night, which we are voting for right now. Which movie are we going to see for movie night? Will it be Death Wish 2, Death Wish 3, Death Wish 4, or kind of sort of my lightweight favorite, Death Wish 5? Because at that point, you're like, 
who's dating Charles Bronson? He's like 100 years old. How are Beetlejuice. You, so you said Beetlejuice is dating him? <laughs> 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 like, have you seen, Eric, have you seen any of the Death Wish movies? Yes. It's been a while. It's, you, it's I, been a long time. They are my go-to uh, comfort food, as you people say. Um. um there's nothing like watching 70-year-old Charles Bronson take out an entire criminal organization <laughs> with his bare hands. And does anyone know what job he has in that? What he is? He's not a cop. He's an architect. He is an architect that has taken out... I don't watch the first Death Wish. Only start with Death Wish 2 because that's, that's when it really starts getting good. Larry Fish well, you know, all those movie. access to all that concrete, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're building a new hospital over here that I'm designing. Yeah. He, he never even builds anything. And, and he comes, he, he goes from L.A. to New York. And he just got every movie. If you've seen the first one, he's in New York. The second one, he's in L.A. And the third one, he's back in New York. And the third one... It's like Charles Bronson is Kevin McAllister from Home Alone. And he has a bunch of practical jokes that he defeats an entire gang with. And then Death Wish 4 is the best one where he kills the bad guy 10 feet away with a grenade launcher machine gun for no good reason. So you guys can choose... <laughs> <laughs> which one we get to watch because they are 90 minutes of fun a death wish four i believe is where he throws water on danny trejo and then a group of italians explode nice i met danny trejo i, I got my picture taken with him did you ask him why he was in uh death wish three i did not get a chance to <laughs> oh, i think danny will be day. in most movies that you yes. ask him in. <laughs> Did you ask him why he was in Devil's Rejects? Yes, and Machete. Machete <laughs> <laughs> was great. Don't hate on Machete. I Danny Trejo is actually oh, I kind loved of a it. badass actor. You know, speaking of addiction, there's a scene that just he does it so you know also as a man that lived with the hardcore addiction for a long uh -huh. time as well um also worked in the rehab world before he got into hollywood um me vita loca and oh we're, we're my god that's a, that's a blast from the past there's a scene where he's actually talking to the woman that made the movie she's in the movie me vita loca and she had just got out of prison and she sees him and they're kind of reminiscing and then he admits to her, he's like, you know, I'm just all strung out still. And it's just like, oh, it's such a heartbreaking scene. Is that the one with Maggie Gyllenhaal or am I thinking of a different movie? You are thinking of another movie because if Maggie yeah, Gyllenhaal a... was in yeah. Me Vida Loca, she was four. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think she's in it. If she's in it, I didn't know. That came out in like 93, 94. Okay. Yeah, we're it was a while back. Of, That's a, we're we're yeah. supposed to have the woman that made that on this show and it's oh, been a nice. struggle to try to get her and penelope spears on been back and forth with emails for these people for the better part of a year but i have to have the woman that made me vita loca that is one of my favorite movies is it why i'm attracted to bad girls i don't know <laughs> maybe any dip stain <laughs> and on that note Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I'll see the rest of you. Me and MT will see you guys in the champagne room. And we are out.